Everyone ready? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> ever ready for this. Right. Please welcome to RCW 139, Mr. Paul Gross. seem possible sometimes. <laughs> I have nothing to say. <laughs> don't, don't worry, because I know that some people have something to say. <laughs> why, don't, why don't we just go right into it? Yeah. So I study theater and have my degree in theater. You should and introduce yourself and see where you're oh, from. Yeah. So my name is <laughs> I am from Manhattan, Kansas. Um, so the other Manhattan, the small one, um, and yeah, I oh, studied. Oh, the smaller one. Yeah, the smaller one. <laughs> I studied theater in college, have my degree in it. Um, I am getting back into theater. I'm going to be auditioning for Sound of Music here pretty soon. Um, and so one thing I always like to ask is, how did you get into acting, and what advice would you give to anybody? I'm very, I'm getting increasingly leery of giving people advice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I. I got, it was something I think I always kind of liked to do, but also I really didn't like doing mathematics. <laughs> I, moved, I moved around a lot. I was able to convince every school that I was moving into that math was not required of me in the school that I left. <laughs> so I did a lot of biology. I carved up a lot of frogs. Um, and and completely boxed myself into the arts. Because <coughs> I couldn't kind of pursue any career that involved mathematics, so. I think I stopped at long division, honestly. <laughs> when my kids were in like grade three, they would say, Dad, can you help us with our math homework? I said, yeah, the, uh, they, <laughs> no idea how to answer any of this stuff. And I wasn't particularly good at drawing, and uh, that's how I really ended up in it. I mean, I liked it. Uh, so it coincided with my inability to do math. <laughs> but in terms of advice, I, I, you know, I think that I think you just have to really want to do it, and you have to be yourself as much as you can be in an audition. Uh, that's what people are really looking for. Who are you? Not a finished. You know, like if you're auditioning for a part and you're reading that part. It doesn't need to be complete, but they need to get a sense of who you are. A lot of people go in an audition and they you know, put on a costume or a hat. Or I mean, some of that I suppose can help, but I mean, more more than anything, they're really looking just to see who you are. So honesty is probably the best policy. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Lauren. I'm from Portsmouth, England. Uh, I'm going to start with a fact for you, just leads on to a question as well. I'm kind of being dead to say this, and I know if I don't, I'll regret it, but I won't regret it anyway. Uh, you could have been my dad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and might be. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you know, if you lived across the world, different areas, it would go in a in a minute, um, but there's a place in England that would be friendly green, Cambly, might ring a bell. Um, oh, yeah. went to, I think, school then lived there. My mum was born and raised around the same area. Oh, wow. So when she found us out years ago, she passed away five years ago, when she found us out, she kicked herself. She was like, to miss my chance. <laughs> um, <so. laughs> but that does even to my question, what was it like for you growing up in different areas of, um, not just Canada, but elsewhere in the world, and growing up, moving around? What was that like? I, I mean, so, you know, sometimes it's a bit weird. When you get, when I got older, it was hard. You're in your teens and you're leaving friends and you're going to a totally different place. That was a little more difficult. But more or less, I liked it. You know, it was always, 
he my brother hated it. Like he had a hard time adjusting to it, and so now he's basically a hoarder who stays in one place <laughs> <laughs> and has a routine that is so fixed you can't, you know, Tuesday night is Costco night. Right? <laughs> 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 but I think it's. Um, I mean, it was great education to actually grow up in Germany and England and in the United States, across Canada. Um, the English period was great because I, I come off a military base in Calgary and went to this public school, private school to us, where I had to wear a uniform and a little cap. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, my solution to problems on the military base was we would fight, like fist fight which was frowned upon, it turned out. <laughs> in England, I was like, sent home pretty often. One of, one, I'm, I can't find it. My mother and I were looking for it. Oh, I can't, it's gone. But there was this great note when I was sent home. It said, Paul is very rough at play. Today, he pushed Roger in the bamboo bushes. <laughs> I have to thank the British because they did civilize me. <laughs> they taught me how to write in cursive <laughs> and to what a butter knife was, <laughs> which shocked my parents because we didn't have one, and thereafter we did. <laughs> but then I went back to school in a military base in Germany, and so it was. I, I had an English accent too, so that really set me apart. So I had to ditch that and get rid of the butter knife, and I had to go back to play. <laughs> I would have been five, five or six, I think, yeah. It was like the equivalent of grade one, kind of whatever that is. So. My mom's the same age, so she's... Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Debbie. I'm from Hamilton. Hi, Debbie. Um, I wanted to ask you, your lovely wife, Martha, was on Murdoch Mysteries. Do you think you'll ever appear in an episode of Murdoch Mysteries? I don't know. Maybe Yannick hates me or something. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's not fair. I, I have been asked a couple of times, I've just not been able to do it. Yeah, it would be fun though. I mean, it's been going on for, well, since I was in Camberley, I think. <laughs> or since I started school. I think that's when that show started. <laughs> yeah, no, I, and it's, real, it's obviously really, it's a feature of the Canadian landscape now. Yeah, I love it. Um, I don't know if I can speak to that. Yeah, you can. <laughs> Just talk loud. I'm still, it's alright, I can talk loud. Um, for Paul, I'm English too, actually, from the same sort of area as Lauren. Um, when are you going to come and do some acting in England, in an English accent? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You have one. I was just talking to the encore lady who said that um, she couldn't believe how many people in England really loved Juice Howe and the fact that it's mm -hmm. been re-shown. But you wouldn't have to do it yourself, you could do whatever you want. Right. You could do it to any of our theatres and do something. Well, you better talk to them. I'm, I'm completely eager to go. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. <laughs> well, I, had, I did a show, not, well, it's a few years ago now, but with Richard Eyre, who ran the National Theatre. We keep talking about ah. trying to do something. So maybe that'll come about. Yeah. What would you do? Amber. What sort of <laughs> I'm a little long in the tooth now. <laughs> uh, yeah, Lear. I'm not quite at Lear yet. <laughs> kind of somewhere in between. <laughs> Richard the Third, maybe. Uh, yeah, no, I'd love to. It's just it's kind of it's kind of odd how there are a couple of places where people really move, like West End in London, Broadway shows the tour through here, but theater is a very local event normally. It is a community event, e even in London. So the, it's, it's, I don't think the National Theater of Great Britain is excited to kind of hire me. They've got lots of English people they've got to have. So that's kind of how it goes. So you have to, it has to be the right project. Does that make sense for all of that to be put together? Yeah, yeah I'd love to. That's good. Yeah. I'll look forward to it. Okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Jean. I'm from uh, London, Ontario. London? Uh, yeah. Uh, outside London. The other London. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Canada's London as they rebranded themselves recently. Um, no, my question is about um, the Canadian media landscape. 
So I kind of, um, you know, growing up, I, I cut my teeth on media, watching everything that was coming out of Toronto uh, and out of Halifax. Um, and uh, it seems to me that it's changed a lot, especially in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you had any, any thoughts on it, what your experience has been like. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a big question. Yeah, it's hugely different. It's just, in fact, not even remotely the same. And it's changing every kind of five minutes. It's... <clears throat> The internet has driven most of it, obviously. And it's changed virtually everything that we have to do now with any kind of technology or any kind of media landscape. So, and television is not, this is not immune to that. So it, it's going, I don't even know how to, where to, so I film is virtually dead. So the middle class of film is almost finished. The independent cinema people aren't going anymore. There's no business model for it. It's falling apart. Cinema has turned into uh, theme parks basically so you go on a big ride and those are done extremely well but the kinds of movies I grew up on are not being made um, television has absolutely exploded and continues to explode at some point like an expanding universe that's gonna have to stop there just aren't enough people in the planet to watch all of the shows that are being made I mean, we're made there are now more than there are more series on dramatic series on air than there are days in the year <laughs> and and that's crazy. <laughs> and the problem is that even if say half of them suck and the, and an, you know another quarter suck, one quarter of them are real pretty good, yeah. and some of them are, most, many of them are exceptional. But it's but there's so much of it it's kind of drowning out what it's sort of dr they're drowning each other. I don't even know that a show like Do South today would find an audience. The shows like The Wire that we think is landmark would just be another show on TV. Or you know, Sopranos would just be another show on TV. Like I, I think one of the best television shows made in the last five years is Ozark. And I think it's as good as The Sopranos, as good as The Wire. I think it's up there in that Breaking Bad category of important dramas. And it was noticed, but not to the extent of Breaking Bad. So the problem with television is now there's too much of it. And how do we concentrate the viewer's attention on something? And, and, as, and also the binge watching makes TV really ephemeral. Like it just goes... I saw an Aussie show, because I'm trying to get a show, I just got back from LA actually, and I'm trying to sell something. Uh, it has to do with espionage. And I, I was watching a show out of Australia, <laughs> and I can't even remember the name. This is like about a month ago. It's an eight hour show. I watched it in two nights, and I couldn't tell you the plot. <laughs> this, is, I think, is a big problem, because it doesn't stay with us. So in the case of, say, Do So, back in the days when there weren't that, there was, just wasn't that much TV, and you watched it every week, yeah. you had a week to kind of think about it, you would talk about it, you both found each other, and you'd kind of discuss it, and then you get the next installment of it. That's not happening. People don't talk about TV much. Like with a brand new show, you watch it alone, or maybe you're watching it with your partner, but you're not, I don't know, it's just a really different world. And that, ha that happened in, a, in the last three or four years, where it just took off like that. The thing that's kind of encouraging, I think, is that th there's a lot of great writing. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the, the very best drama is being made for television. The best comedy is being made. Um, and, and LA at the moment, because it will drive the world as to where all of this goes, is in these big companies are in a are at war. And it, first of all, everyone's trying to kill Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> this juggernaut that has, I don't even know what to do with Netflix now. Like, I'll flick on it, I don't know which one to click. <laughs> How did you get 10 more shows since I last checked? <laughs> what are they about? I don't even have time to read what they're about. <laughs> It's, a, it's mental how much of there, there is. But there, for instance, to give you an idea of what's happening. So CBS is reintegrating with Viacom. Viacom is this huge multimedia you know, giant corporation. 
Uh, CBS and Viacom are then going to buy Stars. <coughs> Stars is an international streaming platform, not as big profile in the United States, but it's pretty huge. That's going to be a multi-billion dollar deal. That'll get folded in there. Lionsgate owns Stars at the moment. They'll they'll sell it for the money and they'll move themselves somewhere else. Uh, Disney is about to come online. Disney Plus. Disney has a huge library, and they're going to sell their streaming service for $6.99 a month. So if Netflix is at 10 or 11, it means that everybody is going to leave Netflix. In fact, 150,000 U.S. subscribers left last month, getting ready, one assumes, to move over to Disney Plus, which means Netflix could tumble. Uh, Disney Plus is going to sell it cheap for as long as they can hang in there and beat people to death. Uh, Disney also owns Hulu. So Hulu will cease to be its own independent entity. So what's happening is this giant war is underway and it will start to consolidate down to a few manageable big companies. And then, then they may stop spending as much money as they're spending. They're, they are spending money now that is berserk money in order to win this war. And it's not coming back. I mean, they're, they're posting losses left, right, and center. But it will eventually. Then maybe it settles into something that makes some sense. We're in a very strange transitional period. Right now. And the best part about it is that the, the quality of TV is terrific, by and large. And the hopeful quality is that that'll settle down into something that we as normal viewers can manage and not just feel overwhelmed and think, well, I can't decide. I'll just watch The Born Identity again. <laughs> Hi. Um, oh, sorry. No, sorry. Okay. If you've got a question for Paul, just put your hand up and we can pass the mic around. Hi. Uh, my name is Rebecca. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I'm on the wire. Uh, and uh, as a curler, I want to thank you for one of the greatest stories. <laughs> <laughs> I will be moving in October, hopefully, uh, due north up to Ottawa. Huh? Uh, and in preparation for this move to Canada, uh, do you have any uh, recommendations of uh, sort of classic Canadian film or TV, aside from your work uh, that I should be watching? <laughs> <laughs> That's really putting me on the spot. <laughs> Personal favorites? Like something you yeah, I mean, I think one time. of the early ones was called Going Down the Road. Don Chibib yeah. made that film. It's great. Uh, the Gray Fox, uh, Phil Borsos, it's a great film. Uh, Hounds of Notre Dame, starring my former teacher, Tom Peacock. Um, anything by David Cronenberg. Pretty much anything by Adam Agoyan. Patricia Rosen, I've heard the mermaid singing. Highway 61, Don McKellar, and, and uh, God. Namesheimer. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was a friend of mine. Bruce huh? McDonald? Bruce McDonald. Is that enough to start with? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still got some thesis revisions to do, too. So. <laughs> I mean, there, there's a lot of really interesting films. And then there's the entire stuff, of this huge stuff out of Quebec. And there's lots of that. And, uh, they do have a stronger cinema base than we do because they had to come the insulation of having a separate language, but they're beautiful movies. I'll ask around for my uh, Kevin Mark Hopkins. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Paul. <laughs> I just realized last time you were here, I was living in Dubai, and now I'm living oh. in Australia, so next time you come along, any requests is where I can. <laughs> You might have a moon base by then, you never know. <laughs> uh, just a quick question. Um, what are your sort of first recollections of Chief South and how you got involved in the show? I, I was doing a show in Los Angeles that I, was called Tales of the City. And I just mm -hmm. I did the second or the reboot of it uh, last year. And it's on Netflix now. And I'm trying to remember how this went because I did. I, I had gone to LA, and early on, Robert Lantos had sent a pilot, the pilot, and I didn't even read it because I just 
didn't want to do a, a series at that time. And so that we passed on that. And then he went off and tried to set the show up and cast it and then didn't, I guess, wasn't able to. And then they came back about three quarters of a year or a year later and said, would you read the pilot? And I was talking to my agent. I said, I don't know. He said, look, they're going to pay you a lot of money. You should have just read it. <laughs> <laughs> so I read it and I thought it was one of the best things I'd read. It was, I was laughing in the first two pages and also thought I had no idea how to even begin figuring out how to play this part. So I said, sure. And then they, they were shooting the pilot. So I was filming, and they were already sh they were already gathered up in the Yukon, uh, in Alaska. We were kind of on the border. And so I had to, I had to leave the set. I and mean, I, I remember thinking, wow, I must be in like Hollywood now because we <laughs> left the set in a quite a long car and went to an airfield and got on a private plane, <laughs> jet, and flew to. White Horse, and then got driven into Skagway. Uh, and then I met everybody at the bar at the hotel we were at. And it was it was I, it was pretty disorienting. I, I hadn't been in any of the clothes. I didn't, you know. But, and the first person I was talking to was Gordon Pinsent, who was in, who had lost his mind because he had. I never really had it all that. <laughs> <laughs> he had written a play and just before he had come out to the north and he had written this play and he had lost it in his computer somehow. <laughs> Which if you write it all and you lost the whole thing, I said, surely you gotta get, someone's got to have a hard drive and he's like practically crying so no I don't, I, I don't. <laughs> So that's how it began, it began on that kind of down note. But he was quite thrilled to be there. And then I was talking to somebody else. Oh yeah, yeah, it was a crew person. He said, oh, it's so great to be here. I'm gonna get a great tan tomorrow. I said, you no. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna be on a snow field. It's like, that, you have to put on a lot of stuff. You have to put stuff up your nose, really coat your lips, you need zinc. And, and uh, he said, no, no, it's gonna be great. I think he might have been one of the guys that was sent back to Toronto. <laughs> Lips came off. <laughs> and then the other thing that was really wacky is they hadn't been shooting. You, they were in. We were in a big bottomless bowl, so bottomless snow, really. And I'd said to some, "Do we have? Sn we got a lot of snowshoes?" And I said, "No, I don't think we're going to need snowshoes." <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, it was. It was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. So that. <laughs> The director would say, I think we're going to, let's move the camera over there. And it would be maybe 75 feet. And it would take an hour. <laughs> watching this, the guy was, had the, the sound, tech, the sound recorders had his, a cart, you know, where the, the tape recorders and everything sit on. And he had fashioned this kind of weird strap and he'd crawl <laughs> <laughs> It was absolutely nuts. It was nuts. And also, I'd never run a dog sled team. And they, the light was going down. This is when it happens on a set, the light's falling, everybody gets panicky, and they go, we gotta move. <laughs> and so this guy ran over to me and said, okay, here it is. He said, you put your feet on here, you don't have to say mush, that's just foaming, they don't do that. You go, get going, and they'll get going, and uh, if it feels like you're headed for a cliff, and I'm, what? <laughs> and if it feels like you're heading for a cliff, then uh, this little square, the bounces along the ground, it has sort of cleats in it, you put your foot down there, if that doesn't slow it down, there's this hook, you throw it, to the back the trails, and if that doesn't work, tip the cart and fall on it. Wait, but this is going by 700 miles an hour, and like, what? Like, action! I was zooming along with these dogs, they actually get going pretty quick, and I'm going, this is good, and then all of a sudden they're turning left, and I can see it's just a cliff, it's like, <laughs> over there so they're going in the wrong direction I don't know how to do anything about that because I didn't get anything about the reins or... so I stand on the thing that doesn't seem to be doing anything I throw down the hook and it just came it wasn't actually tied on that just came off and I'm thinking what was the last thing oh yeah 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 <laughs> 
was absolutely bananas. That, in fact, that whole week up there was just crazy. <laughs> we were doing a part, part of, I don't know what it was. It was something at the border, anyway, between Canada and the United States. And it's just a small little border crossing. And there was a plane, a silver, a little old plane that had just been rented as to be part of the backdrop. It wasn't supposed to fly or anything. And it, and it was sitting there like a bush plane. And we were delayed by two hours or something. And the pilot decided suddenly he was going to go for a fly. <laughs> <laughs> and so he starts to take off on the road. And everyone's standing there. And I, you know, your brain can compute distances pretty quickly. And it's like, he, you're not going to clear that building. <laughs> And he's going along, along, and all of a sudden, he realizes he can't get it. <laughs> and then just sort of turned it in a cartwheel <laughs> in, into the border crossing building. <laughs> and there was a girl coming out of the craft service truck with a tray of stuff, and the wing went right across here and cut her t shirt, didn't touch her skin. <laughs> Completely crumpled the airplane. <laughs> and the director says, Well, <laughs> I think we'll have to shoot something else. <laughs> yeah, it was nice, but we had a curse on the show. I don't know if you've heard about it. Oh, yeah. We had the curse. Because we didn't bury, uh, ceremonially bury the carcasses of the caribou that we were using. But I do recall the line producer saying, it's getting kind of weird because I got a call from uh, one of our First Nations people on the show, and he said, you got basically a curse. And then I had to call CBS. <laughs> uh, we got a problem up here. What? Uh, we got a curse. <laughs> uh, we got a, there's, a, there's a curse. We've got to bury these properly. And it, and it kind of continued that way. I mean, it, the whole pilot was like, like that. Uh, just before, I, I'll tell you a bit more of the crazy shit in Toronto. <laughs> So I don't know which night it was, but we were coming down from the mountain, and I, we were using helicopters to get people and equipment up and down, and I just came down on a, on on that dog sled. <laughs> it was like the most beautiful thing to come down all the way down. It took about 25 minutes or something. The stars were out, the dogs were kind of puffing and puffing, and it is, yeah, that's why you want to do this job. You get these kinds of experiences. Anyway, we got to Toronto and we were shooting. So I'll just say two of the things. That, there were many other things that happened. At the park. <laughs> but we were shooting at the Alma Combo. I'm sure you've heard about this. But that, we blew it up. We blew up a landmark bar that the Stones had recorded in and played in. And we blew it up. Because we had a raving lunatic for a special effects guy <laughs> who had put in... Well, there were two things that called for a shotgun blast, and one was in a mirror, and he had a coil of primer cord about that big in the mirror, and primer cord is like, looks like yellow extension cord, but it's, it's basically plastic explosive, and a little bit of it will blow a huge hole in hard packer, and he had a coil of it, and I thought, that seems like a lot, and there was an even a bigger charge in the pool table, and so we were, when we were getting ready to shoot the shot of the bad guy shooting the shotgun, which is nuts. Like, I shot a shotgun and it doesn't, like, obliterate a gerbil. <laughs> it's pellets. It's not like a bazooka. Anyway, <laughs> they, it kicked everybody out, but I guess because I was wearing the red outfit, I got to stay in. And I was sitting with the, standing with the director, Fred Gerber, and we were behind bulletproof plexiglass, which seemed bonkers to me. And, and everybody else was removed. And so they ran the, the thing, and then the explosion hit. <laughs> but Fred, just before it happened, he says, I had a funny feeling about this. <laughs> and he put his headphones on, and we were blown like three feet back out of the wall. The whole camera housing, which was sandbag, was blown back. It blew all of those, uh, the fan blades straight up. It blew the windows completely out of everything. It was so big that it blew the... The pool table up above where extras were sitting up there, it came two feet off the floor. They came up in their chairs. Up the floor. Yeah, we blew it up. And of course, none of it's on film because it blew out all of the lights. It was like pit, it was pitch black in there. And after we kind of recovered, because it's quite an explosion, and Fred takes these things and says, What a fucking idiot. 
we couldn't make it out the front because it was all cluttered up with shit that had been blown over near the door. So we went out the back into the alleyway and wandered around to the front on, and it was on Spadina. And by the time we got around, it blew like the don't don't break in here metal bars out of the housing of the windows. And by the time we got to the front, the whole brain trust had gathered around, all the producers, and they were all like completely green. <laughs> And staring at the ground because we weren't anywhere finished with shooting the stuff we had to do in that location so we had to go back which I think they realized meant we have to rebuild the place <laughs> like the costs on this just kept going up and up and up so everyone's staring at the ground looking horrified and then one of the craft service people came out with a, a tray said fruit cups <laughs> And then, so the yeah, so the curse, the curse continued until the very last shot, and it was a pickup shot of something that we didn't get or a close up that was required. So we were at a parking in a parking lot somewhere, kind of, you know, like Eastern or one of the you know Richmond or something comes down off the, and I was just standing on a boxes, and so they'd shoot up into the sky and say something. I can't remember what the line was, and. I'm just about to do the final take, and he goes, oh, fucking bang. Some car come racing off the exit and slammed into the back of one of our uh, crew trucks. I mean, the guy was fine, but it's like, what is going on? It's broad daylight. <laughs> so then, and I can't remember, I wish I could remember the entire story of how this poor woman had to go and take the carcasses, because we had to keep using them down to, to somewhere at Six Nations, I think, at, at the reserve and try and, bear, and have them properly buried. Uh, yeah, because that's not, she got stopped and then the police gave her an escort and I was like, but she explained in tears. She was speeding to try to, she was late to meet the shaman or something. I don't know what, anyway, she was in tears explaining that they gave her a milk, you know, police escort <laughs> into the reserve. And I think the only reason this show got on the air is that we did manage to finally get those caribou berry problems. <laughs> Good afternoon, Paul. Well, I, I can't follow that story with a serious question. <laughs> I'm Anthony, from, all the way from Toronto. Um, just wondering, um, well, my dad was the pilot of that plane, by the way. Oh. <laughs> so sorry. How is it? How is the ice guys coming back? <laughs> you know, I didn't have any insurance either. You know, the plane, it wasn't his plane, he borrowed it. Um, just wondering, uh, just uh, kind of a uh, industry question if I may please. Um, how would one navigate all the different funding models and different opportunities uh, to get funding in Canada, even in, in the US, to launch projects that at the grassroots level would get young people, kids excited in the arts and in music, and to maybe catapult them into a career that I think is very promising in, in, in the industry, whether it's in front of the camera, behind the camera, working in creative arts. And just navigating the funding model, how to get, you know, get that meeting, get into some um, closed door meetings if I possibly can, to take the next step and bring these projects to light. Thank you. Um, I'm probably actually not the best person to ask for that because I've been doing this for quite a while and then the, the sort of the, the path I'm in is quite different, so I don't really know all of the ins and outs of the difficulties for people who are kind of starting into it. Um, there are fairly traditional routes like film school that's valuable to come out of that. Making something, which is now you know making a short film, you can do it on your iPhone. You can get a rent a DSLR. There are lots of ways of going about making a short picture if you're willing to do it for nothing as a calling card, and that's how a lot of people are, are finding their way. Um, I know that it's worth exploring. Telefilm has certain kinds of uh, programs that apply to people who don't have, in order to encourage that kind of uh, emergence of 
young, new, different talent. Um, and they have various ways that you have to apply for it. It's just, you know, I'm not going to lie, it's difficult. There's a lot of competition, a lot of people out there, and there's not a lot of money. Telefilm doesn't, hasn't really had an increase in its funding in quite a long time. Uh, and, and the compounding problem about film film, like what telefilm is involved in, is, as I said, the market for film is very bad at the moment. Now, that may change, but I don't see it changing overnight. And the television route in Canada is a bit more difficult because they're fairly restricted, these networks, in terms of, or we corporately restricted in terms of how much money they will put into Canadian material. They make their living by buying renting shows, basically, from the United States, mostly. Uh, and they do that at a fraction of the cost that it would be for them if they had to make their own show. So they obviously don't want to do that. Um, but it's, and, and things are changing all the time. So it's worth going, you know, trying to find out what has global got by way of programs to encourage young uh, filmmakers. <coughs> do they have anything? Does what CTV got? What has Bell Media got? And I know that they all do, and that this changes kind of quite regularly. But that's the way to look at it. I mean, the most important thing is to have something. Like, you've got to figure out a story and get a little camera and make something. And that's what most of the kids are doing, is they're making, they're not even trying to be filmmakers necessarily. They're just going out and making little movies and put them on YouTube. And that is, I think, probably what the future looks like. Uh, that didn't exist when I was a kid. You, know, you couldn't just go make a movie. You had to go and rent a big camera and you had to actually get film. You had to <laughs> film. <laughs> It's so weird. I think I made the last 35 mil film in Canada was Passion Time. Mm -hmm. I think that was the last large-ish film that was made on cellular yeah. mm -hmm. in the country. And that was a long time ago. So it's been a long time we have not had any... We can call it film. We should call it cards. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go see a card. <laughs> yeah, so that... I, I'm not terribly helpful, but I think you really... That's really where the homework is, is look up all the institutions that have anything to do with contributing to film or putting it on or television and just see what they have. And their websites are pretty comprehensive. Hello. Hello. Thank you for joining us today, by the way. That's very, very nice of you to come. from right here downtown Toronto and um, two of the reasons I started watching Due South last year, so I'm a new fan, is because uh, first of all, I love Huskies. <laughs> and second of all, my husband said to me, he was a huge fan growing up, and he said, you have to watch Due South because it's all the shots from Toronto around where we live, way before it looked like this. <laughs> so, like two questions for you. Durham Nords? Sorry? Liberty Village? Uh, Distillery District. Ah. So my Yeah, that's quite different. Yeah. Yeah. So my two questions for you are first, what is some of your memories from filming in the distillery when it was a total dump and nobody went down there? <laughs> <laughs> and second, what was your fa some of your favorite moments working with the three dogs that played uh, Deacon Baker or I guess there were more than three, but uh, what was some yeah, some of the memories from both of those? Uh, well yeah, the distillery, I mean it just uh, unrecognizable. It was actually, I think, all fenced off when we first started going. Yeah. Um, it was. We were there a lot. It, it was one of the most versatile sets. You could shoot inside. You had those old crummy warehouses that were just filled with junk. Nothing was cleaned <laughs> up. So even if we weren't doing ex an exterior shot, it was like perfect for interiors. You could blow stuff up in there, and nobody was there. <laughs> we were forever blowing things up. So. <laughs> And they had, it was like our own private lot, like a back lot on a movie studio. Um, I think the best thing about it, though, is Haggis, Paul Haggis, pretty crazy, and he had this idea that we would do this thing that would involve skating, so it was the hockey episode. Yeah. Yeah. And Paul being Paul, he wanted to shut down Young and Bloor. <laughs> have it all iced and we would skate at Young and Bloor. I remember him telling me this and I said, why? It's like an ugly intersection. It's not even interesting. He said, just because it's Young and Bloor, we should be able to sh we should be able to shut it down. Anyway, the city did eventually come and say, no. You can't shut down the major intersection. 
And I think there was other problems like trying to figure out how to ice that down <laughs> was like it was impossible. So we ended up icing it down in, in the distillery. And I I think that was one of my most fun times was doing a skating chase scene in the middle of this crazy <laughs> place in downtown Toronto. It was beautiful. But I love that. So it's I find it really weird to go there now. Because mm -hmm. I, I just have those memories. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then we did that. Oh, and that's where so that guy fell off the door. <laughs> But then the whole city is like that. We everywhere we shot, all of the old alleys and all of the old, so they're all cleaned up, and there's too much glass. And the city's cleaned up. <laughs> so we have Liberty Village. We also shot a lot of stuff in, and it's all glass and cleaned up. <laughs> but yeah, I mean those places were great, and it was also great because it was close. You know, we could get to everything relatively easily. Now it's shooting in Toronto is getting harder, particularly if you want a rough look. You think, a lot of people are going to Hamilton because most of that stuff is. Like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but even Hamilton's going to get cleaned up. Then I don't know. Buffalo, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, the city obviously has changed a lot since then. And most of it for the better. I mean, the distillery is pretty, pretty great now, but it was just a dump down. Oh, yeah, and then the dogs. <laughs> um, all right, it's a long time now, so I can tell the first, well, the very first dog was a pilot, and then it was changed. And that dog was beautiful and, and not a husky. I don't know what it was, but it was very well trained. The next dog was Paul Haggis's family's dog. And not like their pet. It was like a dog they got, and his dad became the dog, overall dog trainer, and his sister, who had no qualifications as a dog trainer, became the main dog. And she was, they were lovely people, but not really dog trainers. <laughs> so that dog, and the dog was uniquely kind of stupid. <laughs> I mean, sweetheart, but just thick as a plank. And so we, <laughs> that's what really is the only, that Paul and I fought about that dog. And he insisted she, the dog was fine. <laughs> and the first take, when we were picked up, we were shooting down under the gardener somewhere, and there was a crime scene. And the dog was called upon to run into the crime scene and sniff at something. And then we go, oh, it's a clue. And, then, <laughs> and the dog ran in, pissed on the set, <laughs> and then ran away. <laughs> And we had everyone in the crew was running around downtown trying to catch this. <laughs> but it didn't really get a whole lot better after that. <laughs> so we did kind of fight about that. <laughs> and it was at the end of the second season. So the goofiest thing ever with that dog. What was his name? Drinking Lincoln. 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 <laughs> he really was sweet. But and there were a couple of other dogs that would fill in for different things when, when Lincoln was the star. But sit was a little bewildering to Lincoln. <laughs> I know, it's kind of a downer to hear all this. <laughs> anyway, Link, Lincoln, Link, Bar, I think he'd been traumatized so much from being on the set. They called him, the crew called him Golden Time, because they bought boats and cottages. Because when Lincoln came on the set, it was at least three hours over time. <laughs> You're going to make some money tonight. <laughs> he uh, it was somewhere in the second year, and he was supposed to jump. Yeah, yeah, he was supposed to jump on a bad guy. And it, we it couldn't get him to, like, and so they were holding him off camera. <laughs> they threw him like that. It was pretty crazy. <laughs> anyway, then I took when I took over running it, I had talked to Rick Parker, who's our animal wrangler, for everything other than uh, uh, Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And I said, we got to, because Frank Syracuse, who was the, my co-executive, came in and he said, we had to trim the budget down. And he said, do you have any idea what Lincoln has cost? <laughs> said no, and it was an eye-popping figure. <laughs> I said, okay, well, I guess we're going to have to do this. Oh, my God, Haggis is going to kill us. And, and he did. Like, he was really angry. But we had to replace <laughs> Lincoln. So Rick had, he said, I've got a young husky. It was Draco. And he said, I'm going to get this dog ready to do anything. So I said, great. 
At one point, actually, Rick said, "Do you ever need him to do? Uh, do you ever need the dog to go like underwater, like scuba dive?" <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> like, how are you going to do that? I'm training him. He'll go on those path escape things. You know? <laughs> and he will go underwater. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to wait his leg. No, I, you know what? That just sounds too cruel. <laughs> anyway, so everything was proceeding fine, and we weren't yet shooting, and apparently I get these reports periodically, the dog's fine, and then I hear from him, and I checked in, I called him, I said, how are, how are things coming? He said, a uh, bit, bit of a thing. What? Oh, no, no, What's, I can't remember which order it went in. First of all, he got juvenile cataracts. Aww. I said, what? what do you mean? He's going to be blind? He could be blind. <laughs> I want like three weeks from shooting or something. So what do you, do you have another one? Do you have a bad one? <laughs> no, it's going to have to be him. He said, I think I can get around it. You can get around a blind dog. <laughs> But then the really scary thing happened, because Rick had all these weird, crazy animals out of his farm, like all the horses we used and all that kind of stuff. He'd have all that, including a big cat, a big, I don't know whether it was Toby, the Black Panther, or was it the tiger, he had like big, big cats. Was it, damn, was it the tiger? I think it was the tiger, yeah. Yeah. So Draco was quite frisky, and he's farting around one day through the bar, Oh. Hitting the tiger, oh. Oh. He was just kind of watching him. Now someone and pulled him. So Drake was like getting squeezed through the bar, and Rick happened to be passing. He said, "I got down, I held onto that dog, and he had his sorry, I had my cowboy boots on, and I'm kicking that tiger in <laughs> as hard as I can." But he said the tiger's forehead is like a brick wall. It and finally, that big cat just let him go. So Rick tells me this is okay. Okay, is he alive? <laughs> yeah, he's just gonna, it's gonna take a week or so. <laughs> like, moving around again. Oh, 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 oh. Well, don't fuck around with a tiger. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I'm not even an animal. <laughs> no, and he was, then, he was fabulous. Oh. He really smart. He, he would just do nutty things. He would like improvise, it felt like. You know, we'd do a rehearsal and walk around the thing and he would go right with us. And then when the take is on, he'd go right with us up on the bench down. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd just add things in. He, he was fantastic. Yeah. <clears throat> the thing with dogs is they don't want you to be have really anything to do with them. They, they, they have, the trainer has to be with them. Uh, and they have to really only have one person they're looking at on the set. So it's tricky too. You have people come on, like I just said, do not talk to the dog, don't touch the dog, don't you need to leave them alone. But of course, you didn't really listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> but he was he was great. And and we could kind of do all sorts of different things with him that with Lincoln you couldn't I mean you might imagine the dog doing something, but <laughs> there was not much point. <laughs> So awful. I mean, how smart do you have to be a dog? Not really, but you have to be pretty smart to be a movie dog. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Paul. Hi. Hi. So my name is Paulina, which hopefully is easy to remember, but in this room I'm known as the Encore Plus Lady, it seems. <laughs> and I have a friend with me. <laughs> selfies with But I also want to tell you that as I walked into the lobby of the hotel, many, many people came to talk to me about it. I couldn't get it in the cab. So I walked it up Young Street and a man offered me $500 to put it in his window. It was the only one. It was priceless and you want a lot more for it than I there is a question here, and my question to you um, is about the other Paul, about Paul Haggis, who yeah. is in a little bit of hot water right this minute because of the Me Too goings on. Yeah. Um, but his career was prolific and 
has been to date uh, Million Dollar Babies, Crash, he's the name behind many, many things. And I wanted to ask you what it was like working with him back then. What did that mean in the context of his career, this television series? Was he just starting out in LA? Was he planning to stay in Canada? Um, no, no, he was, uh, he was already an Emmy Award winner when he came to work on the show. He'd been, he started out in the Norman Lear organization, so he learned from, you know, which is how it ought to work, that you kind of keep handing stuff down. Uh, I think he won an Emmy on L.A. Law, which is the David Kelly show, and he was recognized as being a terrific writer already. I don't think he, he hadn't run a show. And so this was the first, the first one. Um, I had, I love Paul. Uh, we we were we haven't talked to each other in a long time. It was mostly over the issue of replacing the dog. The dog. We got into a fight over that. But we uh, yeah we were great pals and it was great collaborators. And uh, I learned a lot from him. Uh, I mean, he had maxims like you have to write fast, write fast, do not take your time. You need to have something. You bang out a draft, and then you look at it, and then you can start editing. And I think that stood in. I've used that all ever since. Um, he had no idea how to play this part either, and he had no idea what he had written really. So that when we were working on it, we were kind of making it up together. Um, I mean, I would ask him questions like, okay, so I'm in a bar, and do I know these people are gang members? And he would say, uh, yes. <laughs> okay, then why am I not saying, hey, gang members, why are you doing this? Said, well, you don't really know the gang members. <laughs> am I a virgin? <laughs> and he couldn't ever really answer any of those kinds of internal questions, so they were sort of up to me to figure out. But then that became cool, because I said, all right, here's what I've decided. He is this. Well, he's not a virgin. Oh, all right. Maybe. <laughs> you know, so that would, kind of, we kind of worked it out in a way together. He's hugely inventive comedically. I think some of the funniest stuff I've ever seen were these crazy gags that he would come up with. But he also wrote The Beautiful Heart. I think, I still think, I mean, the most fun show would be maybe the, all the Queen's Horses, or the, what we always called the boat show, but what was it? No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm a, actually, I really like that one. But, <laughs> but I, I still think one of the ones that really solidified the heart of the show was the Gift of Wheelman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Paul wrote that like in about three days, and he said, I don't know what I've got, can you read this? And I said, I think it's perfect. Don't, so don't you think it, we need changes? I don't know, no, let's just shoot it. Uh, he could be really irritating, like anybody else. Uh, he was a taskmaster. Like he wouldn't. The other thing I learned from those: you never leave a scene until you have it. Mm -hmm. You don't leave a scene until you think you've got it right. You don't leave a shot until you think you've got it right. And it made for crazy hours, uh, which we had the luxury of being able to afford. Although I didn't have the stamina. When I mean, we did, we shot just nuts. The first season, particularly. But there was a terrible pressure being on CBS. You had to, I mean, we could have been canceled any week. It wasn't, you're not guaranteed just to keep going. And uh, so in a way you had to just keep going until you had it right. But it, may, but it was rough on me. Cause I was like in everything. And then so we'd shoot, I don't know how many times I would stand there, we'd shoot 14 hours and I'd keep standing there. The crew would leave, another crew would come in and I'd keep going. And then often I would go to second unit after all of that and do stunts. It's like a great idea. <laughs> Run alongside a moving train after 18 hours. <laughs> but I did try to say at one point, you, you gotta let up somehow. I need a break. I, can't, I have to get sleep. Like I'm gonna get hurt or something or sick. There, CBS's response was to send some guy up to to yell at me, basically, or they kind of go, come on, man, you can do it, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, I can't, actually. <laughs> like, at some point, I'm going to fall down. 
But we kind of, you know, we pushed through that, and then the show kind of found its bearings. But that, I mean, he never would give up until you had it right. And Paul didn't, Paul also didn't, he's not normal. <laughs> he's not a normal human. <laughs> and he didn't have a schedule, like he didn't have night, day. He would go until he was tired, then he'd go to sleep. Now he could do that whenever, because he wasn't on the set shooting all the time. And he had two assistants who would shift the clock, like they'd be on 12, off 12. And so Paul would sleep eight, get up, go for 15. Sleep six, get up, go for... <laughs> so he kept saying, well, you gotta, you, gotta some, you, gotta, you gotta get some energy. Well, give me your schedule. And I... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, I loved him. We had great, hilarious time. Like, I'll just tell one silly Paul Haggis story. So we were in, we were doing promo in, uh... we were in Europe, and I think we started in Hamburg, and then we went to London. And, uh, we had a, I said, we got to go to a show, because I think Fiona Shaw's doing Richard II or something, we can go to this. And he said, no, I think BBC has picked us out a great show to go to. And it was at some big, huge, old barn of a theater in the West End, and it was Oliver. <coughs> I said, we got to go to Oliver? Like, <laughs> all right, so we go to Oliver, and we're in like the, up in the balcony in the front seat, and then there's seats along the side. And it is dreadfully overproduced. There's all these poor waifs, and you know, <laughs> where is love? We're <laughs> all dancing on tables, wanting more gruel. And, <laughs> and I'm looking over, and there's this old guy with his elderly wife. They're sitting there, and he kind of goes, <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah, I'm gonna be asleep any second too." And then <laughs> something, else, somebody else is singing away, and all of a sudden, I. See, I noticed that the wife is shaking him, and he's not moving. I was like, Jesus, Paul, oh, I, I think this guy might have died. <laughs> and he says, well, that'll be me if we have to sit here anymore. <laughs> and then a St. John's ambulance guy came in and takes the guy's pulse, and he turns to the wife and goes, and it's so perfectly English, too. So, she goes... <laughs> no screaming, no noise, and then the guy got it just demonstrate. So the ambulance guy goes to the wife. And the guy shifts the chair. Tips the guy. <laughs> dragged him out over the fire escape or something. Oh my God. I've never seen anything like this. Like, oh, we have to get out of here. He said, oh yeah, let's go. <laughs> so we're running down the stairs, and he says, we should try and get our money back. <laughs> what are you talking about? We didn't pay for this. <laughs> and secondly, what are we going to say? Your show is killing people. <laughs> so then he says, okay, you're right. And so, I said, well, let's go get something to eat. But of course, it was like the wrong time in the West End and nothing was open. Where did we end up eating? Pizza Hut. <laughs> <laughs> so to finish it off, we get on a plane. We do all, we did all of our press stuff and we get on a plane and we're flying back and we're barely up and the seatbelt, the sign goes off and then this, somebody comes up on, you know, a stewardess, I guess, on the intercom said, if anyone is a doctor on the plane, <laughs> could, you, could you please identify yourself? And Haggis says, well, if whoever it is went to see Oliver last night. <laughs> <laughs> and then Paul also, sorry, the first time I met him, he had this really beautiful house in Pacific Palisades. Uh, did not ostentatious or anything, it was just a lovely house. And quite a long deep yard, and at the end of which was, down below the cliff was the Pacific Coast Highway and the Pacific Ocean. You could stand in the backyard and watch dolphins surfing in the waves. And I remember saying, what? You're right on the edge of the cliff. Do you ever think about the earthquake? No, oh, it's not. It's never going to happen. Well, it did. And <laughs> that entire front yard, or that entire yard, and his kitchen, and den, and everything but the two bedrooms. <laughs> went off down into the Pacific Coast. Oh and he had no insurance, just like oh. the...
Hmm? Can I tell a story? Please. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm Penny. I was Paul's incompetent assistant the last two seasons. <laughs> and my funniest memory is uh, one day we were we had to go um, from one location to the next, and there wasn't time for Paul to change. It was the middle of winter. It had snowed, so he's in his uniform, and his sitting in the passenger seat. We have a driver, and I'm in the back seat, and we're I think we're going along Queen Street East, and an old woman on the sidewalk fell, and Paul says to the driver, Jock, stop the car, stop the car. And he jumps out in uniform, and <laughs> off the sidewalk, and the look on her face, I can still see it, she was completely dumbfounded. And he hopped in the car, and we went back. <laughs> being in the uniform was, I think we were doing the pilot, and uh, there were a bunch of tourists, we were shooting outside somewhere like Thomas Street or something, and there were a bunch of tourists that showed up, and they were Japanese, and all of a sudden they wanted my picture, and I think, wow, this is great, and I'm getting my picture, and I think, wait a minute, we're not even on the air. <laughs> throw him off an airplane and <laughs> But I have to say, you know, just about everybody. It was always uh, anything, you know, sometimes things would get tense or they're difficult like any, anything you're doing. But for the most part we all really like going to work. Uh, it was it was a lot of fun to do. It was challenging. It's always difficult to get the comic scene right is it requires a certain kind of finesse to it. It's not like there is a precision in comedy. And also, for me, it was always a joy because we're kind of rotating people in and out. You know, so Leslie comes one day, and mm -hmm. Gordon's in that day, or stuff with Camilla. Or, I mean, we always had fun, and the crew was exactly the same way. I mean, I, I, yeah, it, it was, without question, the most fun uh, I've ever had. We laughed a lot. You know, we were doing goofy stuff, and you'd laugh your head off. And then get kind of serious when it had to be, but you know, it was a lot of variety. We got to do really nutty things, like nobody really has ever said, don't do a show that has a big wooden boat in it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't imagine doing that today. Most people, what are you talking about, a big wooden boat? That actually was funny because it wasn't supposed to be a big wooden boat, it was supposed to be two big lake freighters that are about 800 feet long. And one of them would be the bad lake freighter, and one would be the good lake freighter. And we had a meeting with the lake freighter guys, and they said uh, they were really funny, like they weren't interested in this at all. <laughs> said, uh, so you would put these, I explained it, and then these two boats would kind of come together, and then there would be this board, boat to boat boarding. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, okay, how's that going to work? Yeah, you can't really do that. <laughs> Why? Because they're made out of metal. <laughs> and they're big, and they will break, and then they will sink. Okay, well, how can we do that? Well, you could do it if you had tugboats to hold them in position. And I said, okay, so we get some tugboats. Yeah, you'll need about 20. <laughs> okay, can we get 20 tugboats? Then? There are only eight working this way. <laughs> So that was pretty deflating, and then that afternoon we were shooting down the lake shore, and I don't know what we were shooting, and I look, and I see these masts above this building. So I go running around, and I see this boat. Oh, <laughs> well, I go find Frank. I said, Frank, we're going to get this boat. <laughs> so we run onto the boat, and it was the bounty. 
And we talked to the captain that day, and he said, sure. So he came back, and said, that's, not, that's not really like, you know, here's an idea that needs to be executed. It's just like, okay, I can't have two big boats. I'll have one wooden boat, and I'll have one wooden boat. <laughs> but we have that kind of luxury. That is not common in television. Usually you have networks over top of it saying you can't do this, we don't like that, and that keeps going up until you... So, but they didn't know what to do with this, because it wasn't, it didn't really fit in any kind of easy defined category. It wasn't exactly a comedy, it wasn't exactly a drama, it was an hour long, it was sort of a crime plot, it had continuing character, so it had a lot of elements that they, they couldn't say, you know, this is a procedural police story, therefore you can't have boats in it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of what they do, they would say, if you ever want to see a funny book, I don't know where you find it, maybe it's online, I think it's called A Martian Would Never Say That. And it's a collection of goofy things that network executives have written to people who run shows <laughs> about what they wouldn't wouldn't say. And this is like one of the bitter quotes is for my, my, my uncle a Martian or my... My favorite Martian, yeah. And, and one of the network executives said, A Martian Would Never Say That. <laughs> That it's really fun, but we never really had no. So I kind of just, we just kind of got to do whatever we come into our heads, which is pretty rare. Uh, but I think that's also what contributed to making the show fun, so much fun to do, because everybody, and everybody would chip in. There were many times we'd have a gag line or the end of the scene line that would come from somebody on the floor, whether it's the boom operator or the camera guy. Or, which you can't really get away with in normal times. No, it was just a ball. I mean, I, I liked everybody. Except for... Hi, my name is Vivian. I'm here with my Ruby from Chicago. Um, just Hello. wanted to say one thing. I. For some reason, one of the reasons I like watching Do South now is it's similar to what you said about Toronto. I have this perverse nostalgia for the dangerous, skanky, nasty Chicago that I, you know, my youth was spent in, and it's not there anymore. It's in the location shots in Do South and some older movies like The Fugitive. So it's just so weird how these cities change. Um, but since you brought up Callum, um, I wanted to ask, one of the things that my roommate and I have talked about a lot is the fact that he got the Chicago cop accent down. Oh, it really? Was a, oh, he sounded like every cop that ever hassled me. <laughs> <laughs> Except for some scripting things where he said things like holiday instead of vacation like a, a Chicagoan would. Or mom. That'd be me. I would have written that. Oh. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, like, what did he do to prepare for that? How did he get that accent so perfect? It's a gift. I really don't know. <laughs> he has. He, 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 you are aware that he's crazy. Right. <laughs> He's got some kind of weird process that seems to involve clothing mostly. And so I'm sure what he did, honestly, I'm sure he got uh, probably some access to a dialect coach or he would have watched a lot of movies that were set in Chicago or with Chicago actors. Um, but I'm not joking about the clothes, like, or the haircut. That was also really important. You notice his hair changes dramatically after the introduction to the next one? So the first time, I thought it looked terrible. So how do you like this cut? Do you like it? Yeah, I think it's really good. All right. That's where it is. And then we finished shooting about halfway through that episode. Says, Why did you let me have this hair? I look awful. So then that changed. Same thing with clothes. Every morning would involve Callum coming into my trailer before we started shooting and saying, I just, you're going to have to get rid of the wardrobe department. <laughs> so I don't know what this is. You know, I don't know anything about clothes. And he's, he says, look at this. And it would be a t-shirt. They were always just t-shirts. Look at this. Okay, what's wrong with it? Well, it's got ribbing here. It shouldn't have ribbing in this like thing because he really knows clothes. <laughs> you wouldn't think it to look at it. But. <laughs> And he would complain endlessly, and I'd say, all right, here's, here's the thing. You've got a day off coming up. Uh, I'm 
a budget, go out, take some of them, just go out and buy a bunch of shit that you want to wear. And we'll bring it in, we'll put it in the truck. And we'll just, you know. <laughs> he would never do that, because that would relieve him of his great joy, which is to bitch at me. <laughs> like his warm up. That's how you get ready to get <laughs> So in, in terms of saying, how, how did he get that right? I don't, it's something to do with that. It's somewhere in that mysterious, what is Callum up to completely? <laughs> well, Paul, uh, like you said at the beginning, it's kind of hard to believe it's been 25 years since uh, it really is. Since it's due south. And it's amazing you're all here. I mean, it's, really, it's really lovely. It is a great thing. We do People do a lot of stuff in this business, a lot of different kinds of jobs, and most of them don't have this kind of uh, lasting impact. And, and, I mean, you might remember the show, but it's not something you think other people remember, so it's really heartwarming to see all of you today. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, so, so thank you, yeah. so thank you very much for, uh, for coming, taking, uh, taking uh, an hour. Come see us and uh, tell us a few uh, rather fun stories with, uh, about your time. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you have many others. A um, couple of things I want to do just before you're leaving. First of all, this is this is something for everybody here. Actually, uh, it's actually a proclamation from the mayor of Toronto saying, "Congratulations, to Juice on this 25th anniversary." <laughs> These ones here are just for you. Uh, so we've had uh, all the attendees have uh, have signed a little poster for you just to, uh, to let you know how much they appreciate. How much we appreciate the fact that you came by. Um, we also we also have somebody who's very talented in the room, and, uh, and she's made some actually handmade bracelets uh, that say Juice Out 1994 to 2019, and she's made them for all of the attendees actually. And the supporting memberships. And, and supporting memberships. Uh, wow. Here, I donated them. Uh, Tina from Sweden. Uh, we hear Kit Kat and this long running <laughs> story that Kit Kat is your favorite chocolate bar. Okay. I don't know if it's true or not. <laughs> on Air Canada. <laughs> but I have to confess that I was flying business Air Canada on the way back from LA last week, or a few days ago. They got a, they got a Kit Kat out there now. <laughs> As you're hearing the last 45 minutes of the flight, they come around and you want a Kit Kat. <laughs> I don't know if it's related. <laughs> but I ate three of them. <laughs> John, John uh, brought some from Australia for you, and uh, oh, wow. flavors like strawberry cheesecake, creme brulee, tiramisu, and cherry brownie. I'm not sure if I would. <laughs> 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 I'll take it back. <laughs> That's a little modern, but I'll try it. <laughs> and uh, and the, the last thing, actually, this, so this is actually our, uh, our gift for, uh, for guests. Um, and uh, what these are, are they're, they're, they're all handmade, so they're little cabins, oh, God. Oh, <laughs> all handmade and hand-painted, uh, oh, wow. that's uh, essentially reminiscent of, you know, the cabin that uh, kind of blew up in uh, the body. <laughs> <laughs> Not a many things to <laughs> So hopefully you won't blow this one up. <laughs> Thanks. But uh, we really want to thank you for uh, for coming, and I want to do one more thing actually, and I want to mention one person. That's Penny. Yep. For the last twenty plus years, uh, she has been the one who's we've always gone to saying, "Hey, do you think Paul can make it?" To the <laughs> oh yeah, I'll make him. <laughs> you think Paul can sign some photos? Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> so Penny, I want to give, get you one of those as well. Uh, and for everybody, uh, Paul did sign some pictures this year, so that's a little present that, uh, that you're going to get. Uh, so 
so after uh, after after this, if you just line up and get your picture outside, so Megan will uh, will take care of you and get your picture. So again, Paul, thanks uh, so much for coming to see us.